And we'll all say amen, won't we? Thank you so much, uh, choir, orchestra, for leading us in worship today. Well, you know that uh, our theme for this year is why does it matter? And we're continuing to just make our way through uh, trying to answer that question. And here we are in May, so we've already had some significant conversations about why certain things matter. And for the spring, we've asked the question, family, why does it matter? And so, you know, we have been walking through various um, uh, facets of that conversation as we've looked at the Scripture. But today I want us to talk about <clears throat> friends and families. Are you all familiar with the word family? <clears throat> Um, it is a word that is used quite often now in our society, uh, primarily to refer to a group of people who now have come together in deep friendship, and they really serve as family for the members of that community. And the word that's been coined to refer to them is family. Now, I want you to think about today, here in this next service, I'm going to have almost 30 high school seniors who are about to embark on their journey. And one of the most significant things that they're going to do over this next season of their life is choose friends. And so I want us to think about how we can pray for them and encourage them because there are many of you in this room and within the sound of my voice who know how significant your friends have been in your life, the roles that they have played. And we want to encourage them as well as ourselves to be thoughtful about developing these friendships because some of them can actually become family. So with that said, I want us to look at a text. It's just two verses from John's gospel, okay? So we're going to look at the very first page of John's gospel. So if you've got your Bibles, I'd like for you to look at it with me. You know it's our custom to stand whenever we read a gospel reading. So let's stand together as we look at John 1. Now, here's what's interesting about this. When you come to the end of John, John 20, John will say, now, Jesus did a lot of other things that aren't recorded in this book. He says, but these things have been written so that you might believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Then he says, and by believing in him, you will have life in his name. Then in John 3, Jesus will say, don't marvel that you have to be born again. And it is through that new birth that we find the life that's mentioned in John 20. But John introduces that to us on the very first page. So he doesn't, he doesn't I don't want you to miss it. All of this ties together. It's bookended, if you will. So look at John 1. Now in verse 11, he says that when the word came, when Jesus came, many people didn't recognize him. He says, however, look at verse 12. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, remember that's going to be referenced later in this book, he gave the right to become children of God. In other words, to be born again. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. Thank you. You may be seated. <clears throat> so speaking of friends this morning, how many friends do you have? <clears throat> Hold on, I'm going to tell you how many I have. <laughs> Let me see here. I have 3,504. According to my Facebook feed as of this morning. Now, I've got a few friend requests pending, so maybe by tonight I can give you an update. I may actually have more than that before this night ends. Well, actually, remarkably enough, not all of my Facebook friends are actually real friends. As a matter of fact, I don't know if y'all have heard this or not, that's actually become a legal question. Back in December of 2017, there was a case recommended to the Supreme Court in Florida. And it had to do with whether or not a judge should be disqualified from a case in her court because she was 
Facebook friends with one of the attorneys representing someone in the case. So the Supreme Court said in Florida they would hear the appeal because the Third District Court of Appeal rejected a request to disqualify Miami-Dade County Circuit Court Judge Beatrice Butchko. The dispute stems from Butchko being a Facebook friend of, etern of attorney Israel Reyes. Reyes was hired to represent insurance company executive in a case before her. The counsel for the other side sued a former client, the United States Automobile Association, for breach of contract and fraud, and they are seeking, they were seeking for her to be disqualified. They said this conflicts with a decision that's already been made because in one case, at least in Florida, a, a case was thrown out because the judge was Facebook friends with the prosecutor. So this thing drug on for a while, and here is what's happened if you haven't heard. Finally, Florida Judge Beatrice Butchko did not have to give up a case because of a Facebook friendship she had with an attorney. The Florida State Supreme Court ruled in November 2018 by a four to three vote that just because she's Facebook friends does not mean that they're real friends. Let, let me read you what the court said. It said, Facebook friendships are more casual and not as long-lasting, and the connection may be as fleeting as the flick of a delete button. <laughs> Thus, the existence of a social media friendship between a judge and attorney does not necessarily reasonably convey a close friendship. So, with that said, how would you define a real, true friend? And how many of them do you have? And do you find yourself being a real, true friend? I came across a few quotes about friendship. <clears throat> One person said, if I have to clean my house before you come over, we're not real friends. <clears throat> <laughs> Oscar Wilde said, a true friend stabs you in the front. Someone else said, friends are God's way of apologizing for our families. <laughs> Mark Twain said, I don't like to commit myself about heaven and hell. You see, I have friends in both places. <clears throat> I really like this one. Guy Kaiser said, I bet dying vultures have lots of awkward moments with their friends. <clears throat> you know, think about that for just a second. <clears throat> um, one person said, true friendship is when you walk into someone's house and your Wi-Fi connects automatically. <laughs> but Emile saint Genis says this, true friends don't judge each other. They judge other people together. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, think about friendship. As I said, I'm going to share a word of encouragement to our high school seniors about developing true friends. And it's really a word for all of us. Now, what does it mean to live in relationship with other people? Now, y'all know we have been using clips from various TV shows each week in this sermon series. Well, my goodness, we could have chosen any number of TV shows um, throughout TV history because there have been just some great friends on television shows. Uh, my goodness, what about Lucy Ricardo and Ethel Mertz? Th those were two great friends. Now, the folks in the next service will have to Google that to know who, who that is. But do you think Frodo would have ever made it to the Mount of Doom if he hadn't had encouragement from Samwise Gamgee or, or Harry Potter and uh, Ron and Hermione or or we've already used a clip from Fresh Prince of, Be of Bel-Air, Will and Carlton. And I think about all these friends we've seen on TV shows through the years. People like Bert and Ernie and Hawkeye and Trapper John and Fred and Barney and Felix and Oscar and Batman and Robin and Jerry Seinfeld and George Costanza and Laverne and Shirley and Andy and Barney. I mean... They're just a lot of great friends. What's the most obvious one, though, if you're going to talk about friends? Friends. friends. Um, that show was on TV from 1994 to 2004. 
Now, I'll admit, um, that was not a show that I ever watched that much. Uh, but it did capture America's imagination, though. It became an incredible hit in our country. You know that. Uh, in spite of its questionable moral depictions, um, the show did capture something, though, about friendship. How these, these people learned how on this show, there were six of them, y'all remember the, the show, they somehow captured that unconditional acceptance, that, that con daily consistency that both of them are so much of a, a part of real friendships. And that TV show was incredibly successful. It launched the careers of some of the folks that were on it. Um, so the storyline was these six young adults are living in Manhattan, and they're dealing with all the challenges of being young adults. They're also dealing with the image-conscious, fast-paced culture of New York City. And as I said, even though the morality was often questionable on this show, somehow or another, these six people crafted an environment where they could just be themselves, be real with each other, and they actually became a family. As a matter of fact, the final episode of Friends, May of 2004, it was the single most watched television show of the decade. So I want to just show you a clip this morning from that very last episode. As a matter of fact, we're going to show you the very last scene from Friends. <clears throat> Please be careful with that. It was my grandmother's. Be careful. Thank you. Uh, if that falls off the truck, it wouldn't be the worst thing. <laughs> oh, honey, I forgot. I promised Trigger that we'd leave our keys. Oh, okay. This is it. Yeah. I guess so. This is harder than I thought it would be. Yeah, it's gonna be okay. Okay. Well, do you guys have to go to the new house right away or do you have some time? funny about that question where it was actually ad-libbed because the set when they finished this final filming was already being disassembled in the coffee shop that they all met in had already been taken apart and so they allowed that line to be in because the question was where we're going to go because they've already gotten rid of where we normally go but here's what's interesting about um, that show I uh, I read um, a report on just how these folks have engaged in relationships since. There have been a few bumps in the road here and there. But do you know that every single one of those cast members, when pushed, here's what they all said about the cast of Friends. They said the cast has actually become our family. I found that quite fascinating. <clears throat> in other words, Friends play such a a crucial role in our lives. Well, what does the Bible have to say about friendship? Actually, it has a lot to say about friendship. But what I'd like to do today is point you to this text that we just read in John 1 um, to think about our friends as Christians. C.S. Lewis said, friendship is born at that moment when one person says to another, what? You too. I thought I was the only one. 
C.S. Lewis also said this about friendship. He said it's unnecessary. He said it's like philosophy. It's like art. It has no survival value. Rather, it is one of the things which give value to survival. And so friendship is incredibly important. Well, here's where I want us to begin this morning. I want you to think about the church. Let me, let me say this about the church. I believe the church is a spiritual family. You know, we live in a mobile society right now. And we have people who live here in the Metroplex who have no family connections in this community. That's true of every major metropolitan area in America. There are folks who find their way because of jobs or opportunities or school. And they find themselves in places where they have no roots. They have no moorings, if you will. They have, they have no deep family connections. It's not true for many of you here in this room, but it's true for most. People that find their way, or it's true for many rather, that find their way into major metropolitan areas, they don't always bring their extended families with them. They come to make a life for themselves, to, to find a place to where they can live. Well, the church to me is an, offers an incredible opportunity for all of us because the church is actually a spiritual family. Let's look back at this text. If you still have your Bible open, if you look back at John 1, John uses familial language to refer to the dynamic of what we're experiencing as a church. Because John says this, he says, the people who received Jesus, the ones who actually will believe in his name, he says he gives them the right, exousia is the Greek word, the, the opportunity, the privilege to now become children of God. And so the church is actually comprised of the children of God. So that means that when you find your way into a place like this, regardless of your family connections, regardless of, of where you happen to have grown up or whatever, whatever root system you had that maybe you've left, when you join a local church, you now become a part of the family of God. Paul uses that, that phrase when he writes his letter to Timothy. He calls it the household of faith. John is going to be a little more poignant. He's going to talk about new birth. He's going to talk about finding life in the name of Jesus. And he says, now, when you're born into this, you are a part of the children of God. And I would tell you that um, it's, a, it's a powerful gift, and I don't want us to take it for granted. Uh, David Benner is a psychologist. He's a spir spiritual director. He's written a book called Sacred Companions. Here's what he says in the opening chapter of that book. The essence of Christian spirituality is following Christ on a journey of personal transformation. The distant land to which we are called is not heaven. It's the new creature into which Christ wishes to fashion us. The whole and a holy person that finds his or her uniqueness, identity, and calling in Christ. Spiritual friends accompany each other on that journey. So in other words, this psychologist is telling us something that we really already know intuitively. We need companionship. We need people to be a part of our lives. The very first not good in the Bible, the Bible says about Adam, it was not good for him to be what? Alone. That's not a word about being single. That's a word about having no companions. You can be married and be alone. You can be in a large family and be alone. It's not, it's not about singleness or being married. That's not the point of that text. It's the point, the point is that God's created us for community and companionship, and we all need it. And so when we find our way into a local church, here's what happens. You now become a part of a community, and we are brothers and sisters in Christ. And that means we now share life together. We're a spiritual family. It's the imagery of new birth in John is a call for us to love each other. We're going to read that in John's gospel. Jesus will even say, greater love has no man than this, that he will lay down his life for another. It means there's a certain sacrificial call to love, to give, to serve, to just walk alongside one another. You know, some of us are golf fans, and we're watching the PGA Championship right now. And we all have favorite golf. Those of us that are golf fans, you have favorite golfers. You have golfers that you don't care for so much. Most of them you don't know. You just make a decision based upon what you've seen. 
But um, one of the golfers who's in contention this weekend is Bryson DeChambeau. He's a graduate of SMU. DeChambeau, when he won the U.S. Amateur, he was competing in the U.S. Amateur back in 2015, DeChambeau's dad, John DeChambeau, was very ill in those days. And the person who was uh, making a comment about Bryson said something about his dad, that his dad was dealing with a severe case of diabetes and he was on dialysis. Well, unbeknownst to whoever was watching that show, one of John DeChambeau's friends from high school was watching the show. They'd lost touch with each other, but they'd been friends when they were, when they were much younger. And so he had lost touch with them, didn't know what was going on. But you have to admit the name DeChambeau is kind of an unusual name. If somebody's named DeChambeau, this guy was paying attention. So this man ends up getting in touch with Bryson DeChambeau and finally gets connected to his dad and they have a reunion phone call. They end up having a meeting at one of the golf tournaments. Well, while they're there having that conversation, this friend from DeChambeau's childhood asks John, what do you need? He said, well, I need a kidney. And so this guy prayed about it, thought about it, and decided to donate his kidney to his childhood friend. Hadn't seen each other in years as adults. And so he did it. And it gave John DeChambeau back in 2017, 2018, several more years of life. The kidney was a match. It took place. Great sacrifice on behalf of the friend. Took months to recover. But John DeChambeau was able to go and watch his son win several golf tournaments, major championship, and finally in 2022, he died. But just that few years of enrichment took place because a friend decided to do something sacrificial. Friendship's powerful. That's why they're important. And for us to think about in the church, surely of all places, this is a place where you can find deep friendships because we're actually already a family. <laughs> We've been born again together. So, but I think that it's, it's deeper than just getting to know each other. I think there's something else afoot in the church. And what I would say is Christian community develops around our common commitments. One of the reasons that we can build deep friendships within the body of Christ is because we're committed to the same things. We're all trying to learn how to follow Jesus better. We're all trying to learn how to be this new creature. That's what Benner, this psychologist, says. The reason you need spiritual companionship is because you've been recreated brand new in Christ. And now it's our responsibility to learn how to live that way. What does it mean to live as a Christian? How do I manage these situations in front of me as a Christian? How do I do marriage as a Christian? How do I parent as a Christian? How do I engage in ethical behavior in my job as a Christian? How do I handle relationships in my community as a Christian? How do I talk about things in conversation with people, particularly in today's highly charged climate? Well, we learn how to do that from one another. We have companions who walk with us and guide us us and encourage us and bless us. Like Oscar Wilde says, sometimes they stab you in the front. But we do that because we care about each other and we love each other. And so we cultivate this circle of friends and we all need them. And so I would encourage you and me to, to look at these partnerships as being purposeful, where our lives are joined together in meaningful ways. As C.S. Lewis said, I thought I was the only one and then you find that other person who's as deeply committed to something as you are. And your life can join together. And sometimes it's seasonal. That's how it's been for me and Cindy. I would tell you as I look back over the course of our life, we've had seasonal friendships. There are people who've been almost really like a part of our family for a certain season of our lives. There were just some intense circumstances that brought us together. And then now maybe we're in a different season and the door is open for other friendships. But you know what's been amazing about those? It's unbelievable to me as I look back over them, how many of them have been found within the church. Brothers and sisters in Christ, People that have shared life with us. We've walked down these paths together and our lives have been joined in meaningful ways. Well, these friendships can be incredibly important. That's why I would say this in closing this morning. Deep friendships can evolve into relationships that are familial, thus families. And you know, not everybody in the church happens to live their life according to the rhythms that you might think are normal. In other words, people live their lives differently. They may find their way in a different path than you might. 
And what I mean by that is, you know, sometimes people live as single adults. Sometimes people are recovering from a divorce and they choose to live this way now on into the future. And you've lived in your life a certain way. And what has to happen is you and I have to learn how to be patient with each other and learn that my way for me personally may not be the best way for someone else. As long as it's consistent with the teaching of the scripture, we find our way together and we don't sit in judgment over each other. We just do life together and we allow them to be as different as they might be. They may choose uh, somewhat of a different path that might seem different to you. But the point is, as they join into that circle of friendship, they develop those deep bonds and families begin to emerge and then they share and do life together. It's a beautiful thing to behold. And I've seen it happen over and over and over again. We have people that are part of our lives. Some of them we've actually met in this church and they're just like family to us. And the reason I know it is because we don't clean our house before they come over. We know they come, we sit down, we fellowship with each other because they're so close to us. They're, they're like they're part of our family. Some of them don't have family in this town. And we become that family for them. We become that place where sometimes they come on Sunday uh, afternoon to sit down and share a meal at our table and we pray together and we do life together and we celebrate things together. We celebrate their birthdays and their accomplishments because they're ours. We've discovered that in the church. It's crucial, in my opinion, to be intentional about developing those relationships. So what I'm going to say to our graduates today is to remind them of a text that matters a whole lot to me. In fact, in every one of the Bibles that's out there in the, uh, the Welcome Center, I've signed a note to every graduating senior, and I've pointed them, I know this won't surprise you, I've pointed every one of them to Psalm 1, and I've highlighted Psalm 1 in every one of those Bibles. And I've reminded them, Psalm 1's actually etched in the walls of your church, right here in this room, all the way around this sanctuary. And one of the messages from Psalm 1 is to be careful in choosing friendships. You don't walk in the counsel of the ungodly. You don't sit in the mockery of the sinners, right? You don't, you don't choose the path of those who scoff at the things of God. You might be a missionary and evangelist to them, but you don't invite them onto the inside of your life. That's not what you do. You're thoughtful about who gets to be on the inside. You're thoughtful about who gets to come in close to you. You're intentional about it because those people will be life-shaping in your life. Those are the kind of people that are going to be influential for the rest of your life. And so I'm going to challenge them. Look at Psalm 1. Use it as a guide. And then I will point them to John 14. I did it with every senior's Bible to remind them to keep following the Jesus way, John 14. Jesus showed us how to do this. Jesus cultivated deep relationships even in his life. Those disciples, they became like family to Jesus. And Jesus had a common commitment with them. And because of that, those deep relationships were a blessing to him. And they were a blessing to those who followed him. In fact, it changed their whole lives. So this morning, I want to invite you as a church family. I want us to pray for the friendships in, in and across the life of this church. Because we live in a very challenging day. There is so much that divides us. There are so many things put in front of us that call for just snap judgments and quick words and we rush to judgment sometimes without really thinking. But you know what? If you forge deep friendships, you're not as prone to do that. Even with people who might be very different than you in some respects, you forge a deep friendship with them and you find yourself defending them when someone else speaks ill of them <laughs> because you love them. Not because you always agree with them, but because you love them. And that love is what brings texture and depth and richness to a church like ours and allows us to continue to be as diverse as we are and still gather together around the Jesus way. And then we can be a light and a beacon to a community to show them you can actually do this. You can do it in a civil way. You can love each other. You can poke fun at each other. You can disagree with each other. But don't talk about anybody at our church. If you ain't in this church, don't talk about us if you ain't in this church because we don't want to hear it. We're going to defend each other because we love each other. So church, let's pray for those friendships. Let's pray for our, our high school kids that are graduating that they'll forge good, deep, solid friendships. Let's pray for our families across the life of our church that we'll be healthy together and that the Lord will be honored in how we choose to live relationally. May it be so. Let's pray together. <clears throat> 
Father, today we are grateful for the way you've created us. You've designed us to live in relationship and in community. It's really not good for us to be alone. We need relationships. We need spiritual companions. And so I pray, Lord, across the life of our church that you'll deepen those relationships. You'll deepen those friendships. And Lord, I certainly pray for our students who will be graduating. Lord, that they will be thoughtful and intentional as they go to new places with new opportunities to forge new relationships, that you'll guide them in those decisions and that they will find their way to those enriching, deep relationships that will be a blessing to them for the rest of their lives. Help us to encourage and bless that as a church. Pray your blessings today relationally across the life of our church. And I pray it in Jesus' name, amen.